Hello and welcome to Looking Through Luke, a YouTube series where we systematically work through one of the ancient biographies of Jesus known as the Gospel of Luke. My name is James and I'm so glad that you've found us. Uh, whether you're a skeptic, a curious onlooker, or indeed a follower of Jesus, my hope is that together uh, we would have a clearer view of who Jesus is, uh, the claims that he made and what he did, and that along the way we might even meet Jesus himself. Feel free to ask questions or comment below uh, as we learn together. I'm so glad that you're here, so let's jump into our next episode. Welcome to this week's episode of Looking Through Luke. Uh, we pick it up in the middle of Luke's description of the ministry of John, uh, the cousin of Jesus, uh, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, known as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. And that's because, as we heard last week, John has been called into a ministry. The word of God has come to him and he's acting in a prophetic way as he preaches we're told a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, and as we mentioned briefly last week, uh, particularly if you're familiar with uh, some, something of Christianity and something of the, the message of Jesus, if you're not coming to it completely fresh, Luke is not speaking of this baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins in the same way that we hear it and understand it uh, through the lens of Jesus after uh, Jesus' death. Uh, and, and resurrection. So John is speaking of this in, in a slightly different sense, in the sense of pointing to, it's a message to say to people, get ready. And we talked about this uh, last episode, uh, John's message is, hey, as you are baptized in, into this repentance, well, what, what you're doing is you're opening yourself up to the possibility, you're, you're being willing to have your thinking you're being willing to have your thinking about God change, to be reoriented in the way that you think about God and therefore in the way that you live before God. And that requires humility. It requires an openness. And Luke uh, couches this ministry of John in the words of the, the prophet Isaiah to give us insight into how uh, Luke sees uh, this part of God's plan unfolding, that this is, this is the power of God at work as God uses John to prepare the way for his Messiah, his, his, the deliverer, the one who will save, uh, the one who will rescue. Well, now we move on into uh, Luke's description of the message of John. This passage highlights some of the uh, conversation and engagement that John is having with people as they respond to his message. Well, what is this message? Let me read it to you. I'm reading from Luke chapter 3, verse 7. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He replied, Don't extort money. And don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. So this is how Luke records John's message to the people. You brood of vipers. Well, uh, we'll unpack a little bit what that means, but we can tell from the outset uh, that it's not complimentary. 
in case you're wondering. Uh, a brood of vipers is not something to aspire to for a, a community of people. Uh, if nothing else, we, we know uh, in this sense that brood of vipers refers to people who are actually destructive, who um, are evil. Uh, viper snakes in literature were often used to point to uh, evil. Uh, God's enemies uh, at times were described in this way. To be called a snake is not a nice thing. Some uh, scholars go even further. Um, because snakes were used in the Old Testament at times to speak of God, God's enemies, that when John is calling the crowd a brood of vipers, uh, he's actually saying to these people who thought of themselves, who were children of God, he's saying, you are children of the devil. It's shocking. It's attention grabbing. It would get your attention. Uh, if you thought you were, a, you were a good person, if you thought you were one of God's, you're now being uh, accused of being one of uh, the devils, of being uh, evil. He says, who warned you? to flee from the coming wrath. There's a couple of things uh, we need to note there. Firstly, John's in saying, when he says, firstly, when John says, who warned you, he's actually, he's actually issuing a challenge. Do you understand? Do you understand there's a coming wrath? And that wrath is God's right anger. It refers to judgment. He says, do you understand there's a coming judgment? In other words, John's saying the stakes are really high. And the message of John is, you know, you need to change or you will face the wrath, the right anger of God and the day of judgment. Now, in the New Testament, in, uh, which is the second half of the Bible, and, and after the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus, uh, the New Testament is really an unpacking of what it means that, that Jesus uh, has come and it's really an unpacking of Jesus' ministry in the uh, present sense for what that means for his followers, for those who follow him. And in the New Testament, how you position yourself in relation to Jesus is the key to avoiding judgment. So John's saying there is a coming judgment uh, and you're at risk of facing God's righteous anger, his wrath, the stakes are really high unless you do something about it. Well, what are they to do? He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, don't just talk about being open. Don't just talk about uh, being reorientated to, to seeing what God's doing and, and being uh, humble enough to, to engage with what God might be doing in your life. Uh, this openness, this willingness to change, this willingness to be reorientated in relationship to God should actually have a tangible impact in the way that we live, says John. There should be fruit. And the fruit, the outworking, uh, means that this repentance that we're speaking of isn't just mere lip service. It's done a change. It's produced a change in our hearts. It's actually reflected that's actually changed the way we think and has, out, has worked itself out in the way that we live. In verse 8, John cuts to the heart of one of the issues, one of the things that might keep these people from responding when he says, Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Now that might not mean much to you. You might not even know who Abraham is. Uh, he's a central Old Testament figure in the Bible. Uh, but for Jews, this was a Abraham is a fundamental figure as part of their ancestry. They traced their lineage back to Abraham. He, in a sense, he was the father of the nation. And if you know the story, you know that God makes some promises to Abraham about his descendants. And out of those promises and out of Abraham's lineage comes a group of people that will one day be known as Jews. And to be a Jew is to understand yourself as being one of God's chosen people. 
we don't have the time now to get into all of that, but there's this long history spanning many thousands of years in which Jewish people understood that they had been chosen by God. Now, the reason that they've been chosen by God is so that the nations would look at this insignificant group of people and think, wow, look at these people. What kind of God must they have? As as these other nations in the ancient Near East uh, worshipped and pursued their gods. This God must be really something. This God, in fact, might be the God of gods. He might be the one true God. And so, so God chose these people so that through them, the nations might see who God is really like and that through them, the nations might be blessed. Well, I said I wouldn't go into it too much, uh, but the point being here is that along the way, the people that God had called out to be his, who, who would live in such a way that others might see God, they stopped caring about their relationship with God and how they uh, lived as people and began to rely on some of the external things that they took as their security that they were God's. So being one of God's people went from a sense of living in the freedom of that and living in a way that showed others what God was like to using that as some sort of collateral or insurance against the trials and troubles of the world. And and John here wants to make the point, actually, you're relying on your ancestry. You think, you Jewish people, that because you were, your ancestors were chosen by God, because you were God's people, that this gives you a, a free pass. It's an insurance policy uh, that means you don't need to give any concern to how you live and to what's really going on in your heart. And there's a couple of things about that. Firstly, they really were, the Jewish people really were chosen by God. God came and said, I'm your God and you are to be my people. There is something really significant and profound about that. But along the way, the the life of that relationship was squeezed out as people stopped caring about who God is and how they were to live and started going their own way and doing what was right in their own eyes. And so this relationship that was meant to be dynamic and real became lifeless. And they stopped following God and they, they in fact, they disobeyed God. But there's still a tendency to rest on or rely on that ancestry. Well, John wants to let people know that God's doing a new thing here. That how you live in relationship to God is what really matters. Don't rely on your ancestry. In some senses, John's putting his finger on the thing that they held to to give them assurance and say, you know what, don't don't trust in your biology. Being one of God's children is not a matter of biology. It's a matter of God's power and work and changes afoot. Uh, we, don't necess- we don't trust in our ancestry when it comes to how we think about God or relate to God for those that do give that thought. But how often do we trust in our morality? How often do we trust in the fact that we live good lives compared to others? How often do we trust in the privilege that so many of us enjoy as evidence that, you know, if there is a God, we, we must be doing okay? I mean, we live in an age where, where most people, particularly in the West, I'm speaking uh, as, a, as a Westerner here, uh, from a privileged and wealthy nation, uh, we've moved away from even thinking about God to believing that we somehow control our own destiny, that we are masters of our domain, masters of our fate, captains of our soul, to quote uh, the poem. But when the veil's pierced and we recognise just how flawed that way of thinking is, uh, 
we, we have to ask the question, what is it that we're truly relying on? When we're unable to insulate ourselves from that, what is it that we're trusting in? And for many of us, we, before God, we'd say, well, we lived a good life. We were good people. And we treat our morality in the same way that Jews treated their ancestry. Well, something remarkable is happening in the passage. As someone who speaks to people regularly, uh, if you're a school teacher, you can relate to the miracle that unfolds here. Uh, in verse 10, the crowd asks, what should we do then? In other words, John's speaking and people are listening. If you're a teacher and you speak in front of a class, you know that most of the time uh, the students are looking out the window. At least I was when I was a student. Uh, I'm, I'm a pastor. I preach in church. And uh, when I do that, I know that, you know, uh, most people are thinking about their golf game or the Sudoku puzzle they left when they arrived or uh, what, what's on this afternoon. But something extraordinary is happening, happening here. People are listening and they ask a question. What should we do? Oh, my goodness. What a delight and joy to hear that. People sometimes, not often, well, they don't get carried away here, but sometimes people come up and say, oh, James, that was a good message, what you shared on Sunday. I really appreciated that. And, and uh, on even rarer occasions, I make the mistake of asking what they liked about it. Uh, and usually there's a blank uh, look at that point and uh, oh, oh, it was good, I guess. But the, the real test, the, the real joy is when someone says, oh, you know, I was listening to this and, and it's caused me to go do something about it. There's, there's a change that's, uh, that's been made. There's an action that's resulted. Uh, and John's heart must have been full of joy as, as the people come and say, what should we do then? They're listening. We want to be open to what God's doing. We want to get ready. And John mentions three things. He mentions something firstly to all people uh, in verse 11. Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. In other words, John says very simply, care for others. Look for the needs of others. So if you've got a heart that's open to the way that God works in the world, to the kind of heart that God has, you're a person that actually cares uh, about other people, not just about yourself. Uh, and we live in a world that tells you, you need to make yourself. You need to take care of number one because no one else is going to. And John says, actually, uh, the fruit here of a heart that's open to God, a heart that's being changed, that's being prepared for, for God's saving work, is a heart that results in action for the sake of others. Because whether you do it or not, whether you are generous with what you have to people, with people that don't have or not, is actually a reflection of what's going on in your heart. And then uh, John speaks to a couple of groups of people who are very unpopular in uh, Jewish times. Firstly, Luke says, even tax collectors came to be baptized. Now, tax collectors are the mercenaries, the traitors. Uh, the, the, in this particular context, uh, that wasn't true in the Roman Empire, in this particular context, they were Jewish um, uh, men who uh, had been excommunicated by their fellow Jews because effectively they were robbers. They needed to collect taxes for Rome and they, they padded their pockets. They, they lined their purses. They were often quite wealthy, uh, and that's because uh, they used the might of Rome and they could write a number and say, this is what you need to pay. And so John says, notice what John says. He says, well, what should we do, they ask. He said, don't collect any more than you're required to. Notice he doesn't say, quit your day job. Uh, John's not a revolutionary in that sense. He's, he's not telling them to quit their job, but he's saying do it in an honourable way. Don't extort. In other words, pra practice uh, fair business. Or, or, in other words, employ fair business practices. Don't use the power that you have at your disposal for self-gain. And then in verse 14, some soldiers so then what should we do? And Jesus says something similar. Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Now these soldiers, uh, most scholars agree, are Jewish soldiers. They're not Roman soldiers. Um, but you know, soldiers uh, earned a very basic daily income. And so many soldiers uh, felt the need to supplement their 
uh, their basic provisions. Uh, and they would do that effectively by, again, using their power, their authority, their force. And often they'd shake people down. They, you know, they'd come across people and, and uh, effectively rob them. Uh, equally, John points us to the fact that sometimes people would take bribes uh, for the sake of testimony, uh, of accusing people falsely. Don't abuse your power, says John. And friends, we're, we're often tempted uh, to do that. Uh, in, in our day and age, uh, we often do that in very sophisticated ways. Uh, but when we uh, make gain our goal, so often it comes at the expense of others and we actually uh, rob, uh, we disempower, we take advantage of the less fortunate, those who are in need, the downtrodden, the oppressed. John's saying, don't do that. If you're open to God, you're open to what God's doing, if, if this repentance of, of being ready to see what God's doing at work is real, it's going to change how you act. It's going to change how you live. You're going to be compassionate to fellow humans. You're going to be loving towards them. You're going to not just look to your own gain, but you're going to grow in contentment with what you have and be generous to those around you, the less fortunate. In other words, John's message here is that if you really repent, if you're really open to what God's doing, if you're open to being changed by God, of having your mind and your actions reorientated towards God, then that concern for God is going to be reflected in a concern for others. And that's where we're going to pull it up today, but it's given us food for thought, hasn't it? How do we, how do we live? Do our actions reflect an openness to God in the way that we love our neighbours, the way that we care for those around us? Jesus will have a lot more to say about that uh, in the weeks ahead. Uh, but for now, let us consider how we live and ask the question, is the way that we live reflective of the fact that we're open to who God is and what God might be doing? Next week, we're going to finish off uh, the, Luke's description of the ministry of John uh, with a bit of an insight into John's specific message about Jesus, the one who's to come. Hope you'll join me then. See you next time. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, feel free to make a comment below. And if you did find the video helpful or interesting, please hit the thumbs up and give us a like and click the bell notification and subscribe. It really helps us get these videos out to a wider audience. Uh, we're not trying to build a massive following or channel. Uh, we are simply trying to communicate the truth of who Jesus is from the Bible. So if that's something that you can get behind, uh, we love your support by doing those two simple things. It really helps us out. Thank you and see you next time.